Marcus Aurelius, Meditation, the Stoic Reflections of a Philosopher King. During the second century AD, the Roman Empire reached its pinnacle. Following a prolonged period of internal turmoil and unrest, Rome experienced a phase of relative tranquility and prosperity. The initial five emperors of this era, known as the Five Good Emperors, culminated with Marcus Aurelius, the last among them. Marcus Aurelius was not merely an emperor, but also a philosopher who drew inspiration from the principles of Greek Stoicism, a philosophical school that advocated for self-control and serenity as means to overcome negative emotions. Aurelius' philosophical perspectives led to his being recognized as a philosopher king. So, what were his ideas? These podcasts delve into the factors that made Aurelius one of the eminent Stoic philosophers and explore why his thoughts have influenced literary figures such as John Steinbeck and political leaders like former U.S. President Bill Clinton, who considers Aurelius' work as his favorite book. Number 1. Logos, the universal concept that brings order to the cosmos. During ancient times, numerous philosophical schools emerged, covering a wide array of subjects ranging from nature to human behavior. However, one central concept that resonated across these diverse philosophical teachings was the notion of logos. This term, roughly translated as reason, found application in the works of renowned philosophers like Heraclitus and Aristotle and held significant importance for the author, Marcus Aurelius. Aurelius believed that logos pervades everything, encompassing the earth, trees, and even human beings. Yet Logos does more than just give shape to things, it also imbues them with order. For humans, this implies that Logos determines their place within society and how they should be treated. Hence, it is Logos that establishes the treatment of slaves as subservient and confers greater respect upon emperors. But why should we accept such unequal positions? Because Logos, the unchanging essence of life and the underlying master plan for all events, encompasses the entire world, thus representing the ideal framework for its organization. In fact, Logos continuously works to propel the universe forward in the best possible manner. Therefore, even during challenging periods in his own life, the author maintained his faith that these experiences aligned with the grand plan of Logos. He believed that everything that occurs is precisely as it should be, and desiring change would be contrary to this cosmic order. Thus, even when the majority of his family had passed away and uprisings threatened his empire, the author remained steadfast in his conviction that it was all part of the divine design. As Marcus Aurelius states, my only fear is acting against human nature, the wrong action, at the wrong time, in the wrong way. Number two, embracing the inevitability of death. In ancient times, death permeated every aspect of life. Infant mortality rates were alarmingly high and the average life expectancy was remarkably low. Consequently, the author frequently encountered people who expressed a fear of death. However, the author held a different perspective. He believed that individuals should not be afraid of death as both the living and the deceased remain integral parts of Logos. Therefore, dying simply signifies Logos departing from a body that had been undergoing the process of dying since the moment of birth. When a person dies, they reunite with the greater Logos, and their essence is recycled to form new living beings, perpetuating an unending cycle. Moreover, death occurs precisely when Logos deems it necessary. Since Logos operates according to a grand plan, fearing any of the countless things that could potentially cause death serves no purpose. Hence, whether the author was destined to pass away from old age due to cancer or meet his demise instantly on the battlefield, he recognized the futility of resisting either fate. It would be futile to fear something so unavoidably inevitable. Furthermore, the author understood that even the most virtuous individuals eventually succumb to death. Thus, during moments when the author himself felt overwhelmed by the specter of death, such as when he lost his wife, 
he reminded himself that everyone must ultimately face mortality. Whether one is a revered emperor, a philosopher like Plato, or a valiant gladiator, embracing the transience of life becomes paramount rather than dwelling in fear. As he affirms, death, something like birth, a natural mystery, an element that splits and recombines. Number three, seizing the briefness of life and avoiding complaints. In life, anyone can meet their end at any given moment, whether through a sudden heart attack, an unforeseen accident, or simply due to old age. As the exact timing of one's death remains unknown, it becomes crucial to consistently strive to be the best version of oneself. Allowing oneself to be vexed by the tasks at hand only serves to squander precious time that could be spent truly living. No one should waste their existence by incessantly complaining about the difficulties of life. For instance, although the author disliked presiding over court sessions, he always approached his duty with a sense of contentment. He firmly believed that he should not spend a single moment of his fleeting life begrudging his responsibilities. After all, if Logos dictated that he spend the day in court, he should do so without burdening others with his complaints or an ineffective court. Moreover, since our time on Earth is limited, it becomes paramount to accomplish as much as possible. Rather than idly lingering in bed until midday, the author consistently sought to be more productive. However, even though he despised individuals who wasted his time with idle chatter and trivial disputes in court, he recognized it as his obligation to fulfill the grand plan laid out by Logos. This meant occasionally allowing others to waste his time. During moments of doubt or fatigue, he only needed to recall his role as an emperor and his participation in the greater scheme of Logos to regain his resolve. In accordance with Logos, an action is deemed unnatural when it conflicts with the inherent order. Number four, the primacy of logic and the perils of emotion. The author, deeply aligned with the Stoic school of philosophy, upheld the paramount importance of reason and a logical understanding of the world above all else. Thus, they regarded a composed and analytical mind as superior to one driven by desires and emotions. This perspective is rooted in the understanding that Logos, at its core, revolves around governance through reason and order. It is a framework wherein every occurrence is deemed intentional and, therefore, inherently good. For instance, when faced with the loss of a house due to a fire, one could perceive it as a catastrophic event leading to the loss of all belongings. Alternatively, one could view it as a beneficial occurrence, recognizing the opportunity to claim insurance. In essence, the interpretation of any event hinges on personal perception. If one accepts the premise that Logos orchestrates events for justifiable reasons, then they should observe such circumstances objectively and acknowledge them as necessary for the greater good. The burning of one's house, for instance, may lead to a relocation where they encounter a person with whom they eventually fall in love. Alternatively, the insurance funds may facilitate a transformative journey around the world. However, it is crucial to acknowledge that human emotions pose a threat to reasoned thinking. Becoming fixated on notions of misfortune or making decisions driven by carnal desires can generate significant confusion, hindering the ability to recognize logos as the ultimate truth. This is precisely why the author disdained being swayed by emotions such as revenge, hatred, lust, or infatuation. Maintaining a composed, collected, and rational mindset was indispensable for effective governance. Thus, when overwhelmed by emotions, the author turned to meditation on logos and their role within the grand tapestry of existence. Through such introspection, they could realign themselves with their place in the universe and regain a state of tranquility and reason. Number five, self-inflicted pain and the immutable logic of logos. Ancient Rome harbored countless perils, particularly for an emperor. Frequently, those in positions of power would succumb to torture, poison, injuries sustained in combat, or witness the ruthless murder of loved ones by enemies. 
To navigate the pain arising from such suffering, the author held steadfast to the belief that enduring physical anguish is an integral part of the greater good encompassed by Logos. The cosmic plan orchestrated by Logos necessitates that individuals occasionally suffer, facilitating the natural order of progression. Thus, if someone endures torture and meets their demise, undergoing harrowing personal agony in the process, it remains a rightful occurrence within the grand scheme of things, as it was intended to happen. In fact, the author experienced the heart-wrenching loss of nearly all 13 of his children during infancy, with his wife eventually joining them in death at a young age. Yet, by reminding himself that all events serve a higher purpose and unfold for logical reasons, the author managed to maintain composure amid these adversities. Since Logos operates with reason, everything that transpires is inherently good, and rejecting such predetermined fate is deemed unnatural. Furthermore, humans bear full responsibility for the choices they make. Any harm inflicted upon an individual from an external source lies beyond their control and thus lacks the true power to inflict harm. How is this so? Given that Logos resides within every human being, individuals can only embrace pain and move forward without lamentation. Complaining merely disrespects the immortal logic of Logos inherently embedded in each person and exacerbates self-inflicted suffering. As the He aptly states, if you are distressed by any external thing, it is not this thing that disturbs you, but your own judgment about it. Final Recap the central idea conveyed here is, the universe and the essence of life itself are governed by an encompassing and orderly force known as Logos. Logos serves as evidence that all events occur with purpose. Hence, there is no need to fear death, endure suffering, or doubt one's societal responsibilities, as each aspect is interconnected within a grand, flawless design. Here's the practical advice. Interact with others in a fair and compassionate manner. You hold sole authority over your own destiny and choices. Therefore, even in the face of unkindness from others, refrain from descending to their level. Consistently treat others with respect, integrity, and fairness, ensuring that you never suffer the consequences of your own actions. Thanks for watching the Culminate podcast. We cover self help, non fiction, fiction, personal finance, stock market, and artificial intelligence books. Like, comment, and share to support us. Subscribe and hit the notification bell for more engaging book summaries. Join us on this literary journey at the Culminate Podcast. Keep watching, keep exploring, keep evolving.